Nearly this little ragazzo from Bohemia is mistaken about what he saw. <laughs> uh oh, it's all out war. Excuse me. Is something wrong, Master Gods? It's Master Wilhelm Gods Reich Digismond Ormstein. <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, something is very wrong. I know what I saw. Is there was a green balloon there, I swear it, I swear all over Bohemia. You can speak as much about much bad language as you like, but I changed nothing. If you do not have evidence, Ragazzo, then I must tell your parents to punish you, eh? Perhaps we'll let the judge decide when it comes to punishments. Evidence? Uh, what is this evidence? To give a simple example, young man, a photograph, for instance, some tangible proof of what you claim. Well, why didn't you say some sooner? I have the photograph here. A good gracious! What? I had not been up in a balloon for a little while, so I was very excited. I took lots of, uh, lots and lots of photographs of the Crystal Tower, of the Bohemian Exhibit, of the streets of London, of the Hot Eel Cellar, the balloon. Hot Eel Cellar? Oh. And the instantaneous kinesis experiment, did you take a picture of that? Yeah, one picture. Really, you did take one? But all I wanted was a ride in a balloon. I was not interested in boring experiments. Never mind that, can you show us that photograph? Of course, and then you will see. You will see that I am not lying. That I really did see a green balloon. It's black and white. <laughs> well, I see you are all too shocked to speak. Yes, I think shocked is indeed the word, young man. Yeah, perhaps you cannot see what said it was a green balloon from this photograph, but... But... But that is not my fault! That is the fault of the stupid person who made the camera! <laughs> that is one very bohemian sounding cry. <laughs> very well, the could we accept this photograph as evidence. <laughs> It's not my fault! It's the fault of the person who made the camera! Well, never mind. I'm sure you have plenty of wonderful sepia memories to take home with me, uh, with you. In any case, when exactly did you take that photograph? Well, it was on the day of the big explosion. You don't say. When I pressed the shutter release, uh, there was uh, this very loud bang. And a hot wind rushed over my face. That means this photograph was taken a split second before the explosion occurred. Well, if you ask me, this black and white photograph changes nothing. I could not give a flying fig. Lovely language you've picked up. As I thought, Mr. Loon's testimony just doesn't quite add up. The young bohemian boy claims to have seen another fourth balloon. But Mr. Loon ve vehemently denies the possibility, and it's hard to imagine the man in charge could be mistaken. Still, this inconsistency must tell us something, I'm sure. Hmm. Okay. We did get. Oops, sorry. Didn't want to do that. Um, we should look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. Photograph of the balloon. By Gotts. It shows another balloon that he claims was green and exploded mo moments after he took his shot. It's empty. Which makes sense because there were no casualties. In here, the cage was still here. 
Is that Asman in there? I can't really tell. And there was smoke and what the heck is this? This is the arrow that has been shot with the crossbow probably to create a bang. There is this mysterious woman in the background. That has nothing to do with the case, does it? And here's our dear Professor Hairbrain. No one suspicious in the crowd. I don't think. There's a person standing over there. Hmm. And we don't see the stripes. We can't see if this it was striped or not. Surely there gotta be more more eyewitnesses who saw the green balloon if there was one, right? All three of your balloons were carrying passengers. Okay, yeah, but this balloon does not have any passengers inside. Objection! Unfortunately, the photograph Master Gods took can't tell us the color of the balloon. But it can tell us something else, something crucially important. What? It shows that a pictured balloon wasn't carrying any passengers. Oh my goodness, you're right. Uh, uh, but surely all the balloons would have been carrying passengers. Uh, there would be no sense in it otherwise. See, see they're up for pleasure, for seeking the view. For seeing the view, my balloons only fly with passengers. Which tells us that a pictured balloon isn't one of them. So, when the incident occurred that day, there was a fourth balloon in the skies above the experimentation stage. The mysterious green balloon. Oh, oh no, nothing yet there. I only tell you, I can only tell you one thing. If this balloon was not carrying passengers, then it was not one of mine. Why are you sweating profusely like this? This is very sus. Oh god, what's happening with this Objection. balloon head? There are illegal tradesmen everywhere you care to look. Clearly, one such entrepreneur decided to capitalize on the opportunity presented by the great exhibition and managed to operate balloon flights on Mr. Loon's patch without him realizing. See, si, see, si, the competition, eh? Trying to steal my profits. I did not notice because of the experimento that went wrong on the stage. This fourth balloon exploded at the very same moment Mr. Asman was beamed from the stage below. Right, so them scraps that fell to the ground after, and left them scorch marks, they didn't come from the stage at all. It was bits of the balloon raining down, but because no one was in it, it didn't get no attention. A mysterious fourth balloon carrying no passenger slides silently floating over the experimentation stage. Objection! This photograph shows us nothing, shows us nothing more. A stray balloon carrying no one around and operated by some rogue trader. Clearly it has nothing to do with the case. Its relevance does elude me, I must say. The court has seen sufficient evidence and heard ample testimony already. The prosecution calls for this trial to be concluded. So soon! The jury are... Not very happy, are they? Really? Have we really got to the truth yet? No, I can't let this opportunity slip away. The jurors' minds are made up and not in our favor. What else can this photograph tell us? There's, is there nothing more we can learn from it? There's more. Objection! Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, wait. Please don't give your decisions yet. The photograph from Master Gods may well be hiding one more vital clue. Uh, what's that? 
A vital clue? Objection! We're well past the point of more possibilities. It's time for definitives now, so tell the court. What exactly does this alleged clue in the photograph prove? Um, the cause of the explosion. We can reasonably assume that the pictured balloon was destroyed in the searing heat of the explosion. Yeah, that's right, yeah! It was not my fault! Evidently, because the birdcage from the kinesis machine materialized in the sky where it had been flying. And the balloon being filled with flammable hydrogen instantly and explosively ignited. Objection! No, that's not what happened. What? Well, it will appear that this photograph requires closer examination. Counsel for the defense, you will highlight the location of this alleged clue. Of course, my lord. If you look closely, it's plain enough to see. And what's shown is linked to another piece of evidence we have. In a way, that leads to an unbelievable conclusion. The clue that heavily suggests the real reason the balloon exploded is... This weird thing. Take that! The timing of this photograph can only be described as miraculous. If you look, you'll notice there's a bright white line that appears to point directly at the balloon. Most likely, a ray of light caught incidentally on the film. I'm afraid I can see nothing of the sort. If you look with a magnifying glass, my lord, it becomes clear what the nature of this bright line really is. Oh goodness, what is that? Undeniably some flash of light, yes. Oh golly, do, do you think it might be lightning? But it could have been a final day. I believe we may be looking at fire. I'm out of fire, I'm straight for the balloon like an arrow. Whoa, please uh, put that gun away. Indeed, even to my aging eyes, it would appear to be a flame of some sort. But what? Are, are you suggesting this flame struck the hydrogen gas that filled the balloon? Objection! That's absurd. The balloon would have been 60 feet above the ground at the time. No flame could possibly have reached such a height. Objection! Actually, it's my opinion that a particular piece of evidence found at the scene reveals how that is exactly what did happen. What evidence? If such evidence exists, Council, then for goodness sake, present it, man! Which evidence explains this mysterious streak of flame? This construction. Take that! The true nature of the curious, slim streak of light is revealed by this. A curious answer with a slim chance of being the correct one, I feel. It looks somewhat like a piece of firework, but whereas fireworks dazzle their audience... Oh no, did I get it wrong? You fizzle out in a remarkably disappointing way. What? Uh, insults dressed up in colorful metaphors are still insults. Wait, what? If such evidence exists... What is it? What? Explains this mysterious streak of flame that appears to be headed directly for the balloon. Huh? What? Uh, hold on, let me save. How was that wrong? Is it related to the glass splitters? No, we're looking at some something that can cause fire. I thought fire arrows? Did we not examine this? 
thoroughly enough. I don't think we can do anything with this. Oh! Ah, there's some sort of lever here. Okay, that's a crossbow. What the? What is this? It, it looks like a cross between a bow and a gun. I think it's probably used for the same thing too. <laughs> a serious game. This groove here must be where the arrows are loaded, I suppose. So I was right, it's a sort of bow with an automatic firing mechanism. This would be perfect for someone like me who catches his ear with a bowstring two times out of three. In fact, if I'd had one of these, maybe I could have beaten Kazuma in Kyudo archery training. Ah, Kazuma, in every way a better man than me. What is this handle? It looks like you would you wind this around in order to draw the bowstring back and create tension. You must be able to fire arrows with a huge amount of force using this device then. In fact, I would imagine it's far more accurate and powerful than Japanese longbow. Uh, I really had no idea what I was picking up when I spotted this. Yeah, and now we can present this, right? Take that! This was found hidden at the foot of a small ornamental tree near the scene. A good lord, is that a crossbow? An arrow dipped in oil and set alight would have been shot from this weapon, could have been shot, sending a flaming arrow straight into the hydrogen filled balloon. Are you suggesting that you stole evidence from the scene of crime? Th I mean, that a crossbow was used to deliberately. Oh, blimey, you're right. That streak of light in the photo looks like just like an arrow, doesn't it? The, the explosion now of the balloon, it was... Very likely the result of a flaming arrow from this crossbow igniting the hydrogen gas inside it. No! What a, what a, counter, this, this is an extraordinary supposition. If the aim was to cause the balloon to explode, the shooter could have used a gun, of course. However, there's an obvious reason why that would have been out of the question. The noise of the discharge, of course. That's right. By using a crossbow, the projectile could be fired at the balloon silently. Oh yeah, if someone had shot a gun off in the exhibition grounds, it would have caused a real panic. Oh, well, with this big explosion, uh, there was a big, very big panic anyway, no? I don't like this. I should be pleased to have found a plausible new explanation for all of this, but something feels wrong. Objection! Do you understand the implications of what you're saying, my Nipponese friend? Huh? What do you mean? If a flaming arrow did indeed hit the balloon, then obviously it would have exploded. And if the birdcage appeared from the cloud of smoke that ensued. What? Wait a minute. What are you really saying here? I don't get it. Was... was the birdcage beamed up into the sky after all, or... What? My goodness me! Ah, uh, now I understand. That's what that sinking feeling is about. What? I think there's a good chance that a birdcage was actually concealed inside the balloon all along. What? No, that's impossible. Is it? Inside the balloon. I mean, the balloon isn't even closed off, right? What are you talking about? What? Did I, did I just hear that correctly, Council? There's no going back now. The horse has bolted. Okay, let me see the picture. The photograph. Ah, of course. I mean, this is an era where they used hydrogen gas for... hot air balloons. It's not a hot air balloon, it's a hydrogen gas balloon. And did they use any fire? I suppose they did. 
but obviously you can't put fire and hydrogen together that would uh, cause an explosion so that's why the balloons are closed off completely but also a person can't breathe in hydrogen so he must have been already dead so who's this doppelganger huh Let's assume, as I said, that the birdcage was hidden inside the green balloon from the start. On stage, when the experiment was started, the birdcage in the instantaneous kinesis machine disappeared in a cloud of smoke. At that moment, the flaming arrow was fired from the ground, causing the green balloon to explode and drawing the attention of the spectators to the sky above their heads. From amid the smoke, the hidden birdcage then appeared to fall down and crash into the crystal tower. But how did the birdcage disappear from the stage? I think you'll all agree it's entirely plausible that what I've just described is the real truth behind the miraculous experiment carried out that day. Th this... Uh, I... Uh... A good grief! <laughs> what are you, Charlie Objection. Brown? This is ludicrous. What you've described is no science experiment. It's... It's child's play. A contemptible display of stage magic. Both Mr. Sholmes and Iris said the experiment was a scientific impossibility. In which case, this is the only way to explain what happened that day. And in any case, the victim's body was found inside a birdcage in the crystal tower. If the instantaneous kinesis didn't take place, how do you explain that? Uh, um, huh? What, did, did you not hear me? Yeah, the victim's body... Either it's on the experimentation stage or in the hot air in the in the balloon. It can't be in both places. If I may put in a word as a man of magic myself, as such apparent discrepancies can easily be explained by some simple deception. Jura number three? All that would be needed is a doppelganger. Someone who looked very similar to the victim, Mr. Asman. And having this other man appear on stage to front the show, a body double! Ah, uh, yes, of course, so in fact... Mr. Asman must have been inside a birdcage that was concealed inside a balloon right from the start. Objection! That balloon would have been filled with hydrogen. Anything hidden inside it would have been scattered to the four winds when it exploded. Hmm, that's true. No one would ever have embarked on such a risky venture. But he was already dead then. Not necessarily. The explosive force of the balloon gas would very much depend on the, upon the mixture ratio. J sure, number four. Flying balloons are rarely filled with pure hydrogen, but a mixture of other gases such as helium as well. Helium on its own doesn't explode, but by controlling the gas mixture ratio, the explosive force can be altered. The mixture ratio? Obviously, the victim's body would have suffered some burns that would be unavoidable. But no, to such extent. Such an extent is to render this whole obscene charade impossible. <laughs> the jurors are all experts in their fields. So everything that happened can be explained logically and scientifically. The explosion that engulfed the stage at the start of the experiment was no accident. It was all part of an elaborate deception to make it appear that instantaneous kinesis had occurred. Well, goodness me. And if we accept that this is what happened, it means that the victim, Mr. Asman, was never present on the public experimentation stage to begin with. Well, 
that leaves us with a conundrum. Let's say... Let's say... Yeah, someone wanted to make the scientific impossibility look like it happened. So, but the... But the single person who wants to make this happen, aside from Mr. Asman, who was the investor, is actually Professor Hairbrain. He wants to make it happen to look like that it was real, that his hypothesis holds to get the grant money. Maybe not even to get the grant money, he wants everyone to believe that his hypothesis is true and become famous or something. Hmm. It means that the victim, Mr. Asman, was never present on the public experimentation stage to begin with. <sighs> In short, he couldn't have been killed by the defendant who was on stage in full view the entire time. <sighs> this will be very hard for the prosecution to counter. Lord Van Zeeks can't credibly maintain that Professor Hairbrain is a suspect now. Oh, Professor Hairbrain, what are you doing? No! No! Mr. Nanohoto, I appreciate your efforts, thank you! P professor But you can stop now. Just keep your mouth shut, please. You're fired. <laughs> Sorry? What's all this about, Mr. Hairbrain? I, Albert Hairbrain, hereby confess that it, that it was, that it was me who stabbed Mr. O.D. Osman. What? 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 You would really go so far as to put yourself on the death row just to prove that hypothesis holds true? Really? Yes, it was me with my faithful friend and partner, Andrew the Screwdriver. What? What are you doing? <laughs> Order, order, order! The defendant explained the sudden confession! Objection. Professor Hairbrain, what are you talking about? It's... it's what I've said all along! I must protect my hypothesis in my precious machine! Uh, not when you're dead! You stand there and claim it was all a trick! And they're all an elaborate prank! But where's your proof? No, you, you'd have to examine the machine if you wanted to prove it! But then it would all be over! My beautiful hypothesis would be laid bare. I mean, the indignity of it. Better than death? It's clear that you drew the plans for the experiment, but you didn't actually build it. It's quite conceivable that you were duped, Professor. If you just let me, I can prove Barak. Yes. I cooperate. I do whatever you say, I swear it. So, so please. Ensure that spe the special dispensation of scientific equipment act as a tier to and protect my creation. He will do no such thing. Ah, pray forgive the discourtesy of filling my hallowed chalice at this critical juncture. Here's to my learned Nipponese friend. A what? And his upcoming attempt to clarify the defense's position in the light of the accused's confession. Uh, <laughs> he's just mocking me, damn it! Do you intend to formally assert that the experiment was nothing more than a conjuring trick? Because the moment you do, the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act that protects the professor's inv invention was ceased to apply. Oh, right, because it's not a scientific equipment anymore. It's a magic trick equipment. Oh, right. 
the prosecution would then demand a rigorous examination of the machinery involved in order to establish the truth. Damn it! However, if you acknowledge that the machine is genuine and instrumental in the victim's murder, any chance of investigating will be crushed and the confidentiality of the professor's hypothesis preserved. Oh. Oh god, this is a difficult choice. Well, Kauso, what is the defense's official position on this matter? What Professor Hairbrain, my client, actually asked of me was to prove that the explosion on the stage was an accident and protect the secrecy of his hypothesis. But there's no way to do that without implying the professor's guilt. What? Oh yeah. Do I protect my client's life by asserting his innocence? Or do I uphold my client's request but see him condemned? Ugh. I feel like I need to save here. Hold on. Oh boy. Either way, I can't avoid betraying his trust. Well, I can just condemn him. That would get his trust, right? That's what he wanted. You've been silent long enough. Isn't talking or trade, my learned friend? Or has our knowledge of English escaped your confused Nipponese mind? Why do you have it? Why do you have to make it so racist? <sighs> Miss Naruto! There's no escape here. I have to make a choice. But it's an impossible one. I have to give up on something, but what? The defense asserts that the defendant's instantaneous kinesis machine was in fact... Okay, I need to save here. Okay. Um, let's do the wrong one first. I have the feeling if I say a proper scientific invention, that is the wrong one, right? That's the wrong choice. No, I can't say it. My client placed his faith in me. I can't just let him down. But you are letting him down if you say this was all fake. Wait, who is that? Um, what must I... Uh, is it Kazuma? <laughs> no, I don't know who that is. Susato-san? What must I give up on? It's not the it's not the question you have to ask yourself here. It's what can I protect? <gasps> Susato san Hello again, Mr. Naruhodo. It's been far too long. <gasps> oh my god, what? No way, am I hallucinating? What what must I give up on? It's not a question you have to ask yourself here. It's what can I protect? Did you not write me? I mean, the journey from Japan to this place takes roughly a whole month, right? Or or three. I, I don't remember, actually. One month or three. Uh, you could have written me. Am I hallucinating? S Susato-san. But, but what are you? Hiya! Oh my god. Ah, my first Susato takedown in six months. I love it. There's, there'll be time to, to talk later, Mr. Naruto. For now, we must concentrate on the task at hand. We're just working out not what I have to give up on, but what I can protect. <laughs> Professor Hairbrain. Ah, yes! Yesterday you told me that science is the pursuit of truth. Well, my job is to pursue the truth too. Yes, of course. 
And personally, I believe that you didn't stab Mr. Asman. I think you've come to realize something yourself too, haven't you? That your experiment and the machine you built with the victim are questionable. The truth behind that is what we must both pursue now. Wow, that's such a good talk! That's such a good speech! Okay, <laughs> way to ruin the mood. So, you finally opened your eyes. What? Wait, have I chosen correctly in the first place? Would Sato have shown up? <laughs> and it's for you. Albert, oh, you can't ignore this any longer. Ah! Have you heard my land friend's assertion? Don't you have something to say? But Bardock! Lord Van Zeeks. Gosh, I've never heard him speak that way before. You're still here, Sasato san. You're not a hallucination. In truth, and there's one thing, something I've remembered, that's of relevance. What? On the day it happened, just before I began the experiment, I saw a man near the stage. A man holding that crossbow. I beg your pardon? Professor, did the man have any distinguishing features? What did he look like? Uh, tall, taller than me and and thin, thinner than me, with, with straight hair, straighter and whiter than mine. White hair, white straight hair, tall, thin. Is it a one-winged angel? Let me see, one less lens than me too, a monocle, a monocle? Oh. A rather stylish black monocle. But one thing in particular, we have to positively identify the man. You see, I know him very well. Oh, you know him. <laughs> okay, after all, he's the engineer who built my invention. Uh, what? He built the machine? And that's right, Mr. Asman introduced him to me a year ago. He's, he's a man by the name of... Enoch Trebler. Enoch Trebler. Enoch Trebler. <laughs> I know this name means something. Members of the jury seem flustered. Now the name any scientist wishes to hear that the man's an abomination. Not a man any conjurer wishes to hear either. Who on earth is he? I'm afraid this isn't the first tale of this nature that I've heard in scientific circles in connections with that name. There's talk of other flamboyant experiments that turn out to be nothing but stage trickery in the end. Obviously, the rascal is after the government's research grant money. When magicians are in need of money, I have heard of them resorting to these underhand tactics. Some acquaintances of mine with experience of such things have mentioned Enoch Drebler's name before. The man is both an engineer and a magician. Yes, we are dealing with an unparalleled confidence trickster here. That's Enoch Rabla for you. So it's true then. My invention, my great machine, it was just a grand illusion. Considering what we've just heard about Mr. Drabler's character, I'm sorry to say that sounds increasingly unlikely. Even then, when I was believed it, I wanted to. I wanted to believe that my machine would function exactly as my hypothesis predicted. Which is why you were so opposed to it being investigated, I presume. I knew that if the machine was examined in detail, its construction would give away my hypothesis. Obviously, I didn't want that to happen. But at the same time, I knew that if it was found to be nothing more than a trick, then a work of deception, and everything I'd worked towards, all my research, 
All my dreams. My whole life would be over. Uh, I was terrified at the prospect. So you really had no idea then, did you? About the true nature of the machine that was built. And the true nature of Mr. Drabler. I never questioned anything. I, I didn't want to question it. It's entirely possible that Mr. Esmond and Mr. Drabler were working together to use you as a means of fraudulent, fraudulently acquiring the research grant money. When I announced my invention to the cross today, it was the finest moment of my career. I put all the levers and turned all the dials in exactly the way Drabler had described. When the smoke suddenly started billowing out, I panicked. I didn't know what was happening. Hmm, so this was a body double? But I really don't know how the whole illusion was made to work. I... I don't know anything about anymore. Let me confirm one final point with you, Professor. Do you now consent to the prosecution submitting the necessary paperwork to release your invention from the protection afforded by the... You know what? Yes, please go ahead. I'm... I'm very sorry. It would appear that we shall have to suspend proceedings for the remainder of the day now. Lord Von Zeeks. My lord. The court has duly been made aware of another party whose involvement in this matter is critical. Yes, Mr. Drabler. Got the information about a man, if possible, I should like him served with a subpoena. With pleasure, my lord. Now, counsel for the defense. Yes, my lord. When we reconvene, I shall be looking for one thing and one thing alone from you. Evidence that the defendant is innocent of the crime for which he presently stands accused. I understand. Good, in that case, this court is adjourned until tomorrow morning. He looks so sad. Never mind. Mr. Naruhodo! Uh, y yes? I'm... 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 I'm so sorry! I was wrong. You were right. I tricked you. You trusted me. I tricked you into my mess. Oh, how did I ever come to this? I'm so... so I'm so sorry! Did you really have no idea, Professor? About what Mr. Drabler was really up to, I mean. About what he was really constructing. Naturally. That machine was the embodiment of my hypothesis. Of all my hopes and dreams. I had complete faith in it. Alright, in that case I won't say any more. Now, sadly the murder accusation against you still stands. So we must do as much investigation as we can before the trial resumes tomorrow. <laughs> Your glasses won't... Stay put. Oh, well, thank you for doing so much for me. Oh, you're welcome. Susanna san, you're real. You're here. I'm so sorry for arriving late this morning, Mr. Naruto. Uh, arriving late? Didn't you receive my postcard? I wanted to let you know when I'd arrive. Postcard? What? What postcard? I hid it from you, Runa, so it would be a surprise. Iris! Oh well, did it work? I was surprised alright, especially when she threw me to the ground. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I, I was just so happy to see you again that it sort of slipped out. 
And I had no one to throw around all this time while I was in Japan. Maybe we could stick to more traditional displays of emotion in future. Like hugs? I know Japanese people don't like hugs, but... Why not? And Susie's chain was late in the London Victoria this morning. You see? But we made the coachman really whip the horse's heart, so she didn't miss the whole trial. I was watching from the gallery for a while, but in the end I'm afraid I couldn't contain myself. Well, I'm glad you didn't. You set me on the right path again. Oh. Having you at my side in court gives me the strength I need to win. So, I'm, uh, delighted to see you back in London. Oh, you're too kind, Mr. Narodo. I'm delighted to be here, too. I hope I can continue to be of service to you. Oh, don't be like that. Come on. Of course, so what's brought you back? Did Professor Mikotoba not protest? And let's have all that conversation for when we're back at home, shall we? You know, I've made one of my most special plans ever for this special occasion. Oh, Iris, how wonderful. I can't wait. Sato san was back in London. It's hard to describe how happy that made me feel at the time, but despite my elation, our tale was about to take yet another extraordinary turn. <laughs> ah, those foreshadowing the Ace Attorney games make. <laughs> 